remember in 2 Samuel, uh, David violates God's command by numbering his army. He takes a census. God had told him specifically not to do that. And so he goes ahead and he sends his men out and counts up all of his men. And all of a sudden, you know, once he gets that big number that he's looking for, he realizes that he's done something really pretty bad. Uh, and Gad, who was a prophet, uh, came to him and said, look, uh, God's given me three choices for you. You have three choices to make uh, for your punishment. And so uh, David makes his choice and, and the, the punishment that ended up coming was three days of plague upon the people of Israel. And so after the first day, 70,000 people had died, and uh, David is like panicking. He goes to Gad, and he's, what can I do? And so Gad tells him to, to go and build an altar on the threshing floor of, of somebody, the, the guy's name is Arona. Uh, go build an altar on his threshing floor and, and offer up some burnt offerings. So David goes up, and we pick it up at, 2 Samuel 24, verse 20. Now Arana looked and saw the king and his servants coming toward him. So Arana went out and bowed before the king with his face to the ground. Then Arana said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor from you, to build an altar to the lord, that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. Now Arana said to David, let my lord the king take and offer up whatever seems good to him. Look, here are oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing implements and the yokes of the oxen for wood. All these, O king, Arana has given to the king. And Arana said to the king, may the Lord your God accept you. Then the king said to Arana, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which costs me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord heeded the prayers for the land and the plague was withdrawn from Israel. So David understood that if you don't have something invested, it's not a sacrifice. If it's very convenient for you to come here on a Sunday morning, that's great, but it's not really a sacrifice. If it's inconvenient for you to come on a, on a Tuesday or a Wednesday or, or go to a home fellowship or whatever, you're certainly going to get more benefit from it than, than if it's just something that is very easy and, and pleasant. Sacrifice is a very important uh, principle. Uh, now, here's something that, that might kind of surprise you, and those that uh, have been here on Wednesdays uh, have heard this, but I, I really kind of found it astonishing, uh, and that is that there's going to be sacrifice in the millennial reign. Okay, now Jesus has come already. He's, he's, he, he was the ultimate sacrifice. He paid the price for our sins, uh, and in the millennial reign, he will be the king. Uh, that the world uh, is under. Uh, there will be peace. There won't be any war or anything like that. Everything's going to run very smoothly the way it should run. But there will be sacrifice. Uh, in Jeremiah 33, picking up at verse 14, it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. Now, who's that branch of righteous, righteousness growing up out of David? We already know who that is. That's Jesus Christ. So he's talking about when Christ comes again and establishes the kingdom that God is going to cause the nation Israel to be again in the land and to be nurtured by the Lord. So verse 16, in those days Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which she will be called the Lord our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. 
nor shall the priests, the Levites, lack a man to offer burnt offerings before me to kindle grain offerings and to sacrifice continually. So wait a minute. Why are they having sacrifices after Christ has already returned? Wasn't Christ sacrificed once and for all? Right? That was for our sins. There's no mention here of sin offerings. That's been fully taken care of. The burnt offerings were offerings of consecration, where you would bring a lamb to the priest, uh, he would butcher it, they'd barbecue it, the priest would take part for him, part for the Lord, uh, and then you would sit and feast on the rest of it. Uh, the parts of it they would offer, the fat and all that, they would offer up and burn up to the Lord as a burnt offering to God, which was an offering of consecration. Now, consecration, again, going to the dictionary, is the act of consecrating, dedication to the service and worship of a deity. So this is, you know, basically saying, God, I consecrate my life to you. It's just an offering of fellowship with God. Uh, just giving my life to God and, and eating it, of course, signifies that oneness with God and the fellowshipping with God. Uh, so the meal offering, the same thing. It was just an offering of fellowship. No more sin offerings. That's been completed. But during the kingdom age, there will be offerings in Jerusalem. So uh, it's going to be kind of fun. There's going to be these big barbecues. And uh, we'll have a great time as we uh, sit and we offer sacrifices, sit and eat with the Lord and have that glorious fellowship with him. So that's something that we have to look forward to. But again, coming back to that principle of sacrifice. Uh, in Galatians 6, 6 to 10, we read, the one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. Now in 2 Corinthians we read, uh, picking up um, uh, chapter, chapter 9, verse 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all, su all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So if we, again, go to the Greek, uh, back up there in uh, verse 7, where God says he loves a cheerful giver, the word for uh, cheerful is hilaros. Um, it means cheer, cheerful, cheerfully, cheerfulness. Uh, the, the word comes from the Greek word hilios, uh, propitious. It sig signifies that readiness of mind, that joyousness, which is prompt to do anything, hence cheerful. In the English, we know that word as hilarious. God loveth a cheerful or hilarious giver. You know, we, we tend to get kind of hung up on this whole concept of tithing. We think, okay, well, we have to give a tenth of our income, but boy, that's a lot. You know, I can't afford to give a tenth. It doesn't say anywhere in the New Testament that we're to give a tenth. It really doesn't talk about tithing at all. It talks about giving. Now, this is our body. This is, this is our church. This is the facility that we have. It belongs to all of us. It doesn't just belong to Pastor Dan. This is for, here for all of us to enjoy and to use and to minister in, to bring people to, to, to fellowship in. And when we give, the last thing that, that we want is people to say, oh, God, here they go again. Okay, I'll put my 25 cents in, you know. We want you to have that attitude that, hallelujah, God's given me 
10 bucks that I can put in offering today. Doesn't matter what the amount is. It's not about percentages. Uh, I know there are certain uh, denominations, we'll say, not necessarily Christian, that actually want to look into your finances and look at your tax reports to make sure that you are giving the required amount. Um, we don't do that. <laughs> it's not biblical. And so the point is, take the attitude towards giving that, hallelujah, God's blessed me so much that I have something to give. And pray about it. And when you put it in the bag, say, thank you, God. Okay? Give with a cheerful heart. I mean, can, can we agree that God is sovereign? Can we agree that he's good? Uh, you know, how, how can we risk disobedience over a penny out of each dime? You know? If that's what we feel led to give, 10%, 5%, whatever it is, why would we risk disobedience over something so, so, uh, so minor? You know, um, God says to test him in the area of giving. It, it, you can't outgive God, you know, and, and there's stories and stories that you can read of, of people who made a determination that they were going to give to God as much as they possibly could, and, and they couldn't outgive God. It, they gave more, God gave them more, and they kept going, and I, I think of several businesses that I know of that uh, the business owner lives on 10, maybe 20% of the income, the rest he gives away. Can you imagine being in that kind of position? <laughs> not, to, not to just put a little bit in, but to actually, instead of holding a fundraiser, be the fundraiser. You know, instead of saying, uh, could, you, could you bring some brownies for the bake sale? No, I want to buy all the brownies for the bake sale. And then I'll probably eat them all, which would not necessarily be good. But you get my point. Okay. Take that attitude toward giving that, uh, God, I'm going to see if I can outgive you. Because I can guarantee you can't. It won't happen. I know personally... Uh, when I withhold my finances because I'm thinking, oh, I can't really afford it, that's when my finances go south. When I give and I say, okay, Lord, I'm going to put it in your hands, and I give and, and it looks like I've got nothing left, all of a sudden the finances just seem to work. It's kind of inexplicable, but it's a spiritual law. It's not just a, a maybe could work, might sometimes it's a law. God said it. That's it. Period. Okay. So, uh, another form of sacrifice, worship. Um, how many of us, when we go to the movies, wait till after the trailers are done to show up? Not too many? I mean, we get there, we want to see the trailers, we want to enjoy the whole experience, right? Same thing with worship. You know, we need to participate. We need to be here. We need to be here a little early. Be, be here early enough to sit down and kind of, you know, quiet your mind and get into the, the attitude of worship. And, and when I'm up here, trust me, I know I'm not that great a singer. So you guys have no excuse. I'm up here on a microphone. You guys are out there. You need to be singing loud drown me out please <laughs> you know worship the lord don't hold back hebrews uh, 13 15 to 17 says therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to god that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name but do not forget to do good and to share for with such sacrifices god is well pleased Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable to you. So that, that principle of sacrifice, very, very important. We need to sacrifice our, our time, our finances, um, worship. We need to 
give God that sacrifice of us. It's not about, you know, playing church. It's not about doing Christian stuff. It's about being a Christian. It's about being, not, not doing and, and, and acting. Uh, we, want, we want our church, when people walk in, we want them to know that they have been with the body of Christ. Amen? We don't want them to come in and look around and say, oh, I don't, maybe, you know. Might have been some Christians in there. <laughs> Could have been. No, we want them to know without a doubt that they have been in the presence of the Lord. That's, that's who we are, right? We're, we're God's temple. So if, if I'm with Pastor Dan and he is God's temple, I'm with the Lord, right? Make sense? We need to be that, that, uh, that temple, that light that people can look at and say, that's who Jesus is. Um, and again, I'm going to pick on the men a little bit. Are we as men the leaders in our homes? I mean, we all like to think we are, right? We, we want to be the leader. Um, are we the leaders in our church body? Now, I'm not picking on anybody because this isn't just here, but it, basically every church I've ever been to, why is it that the women show up on time for worship and the men don't? If we're supposed to be the leaders, right, we should set the example. Uh, I see women's studies tend to be much larger than men's studies quite often. And again, not just picking on us. This is everywhere I've been. Um, when there's a night of prayer, who shows up? Usually the women, right? Should it be that way? I don't think so. It's getting awful quiet out there. You know, and again, you know, I'm going to touch on politics a little bit here. And I know that's taboo. We're not supposed to mix politics and religion, but, you know, I've seen this thing Ken Graves has put up a couple of times, and I agree with it wholeheartedly. I will mix politics and religion because politics keeps intruding on my religion. And if we as Christians don't stand up and say something about it, guess what? Politics is going to wipe us out. We're, we're not going to have the right to have our religion anymore. That's the goal uh, right now in society is to wipe out Christianity. You don't see politicians attacking Islam. You don't see them attacking Buddhism. There's only one religion they attack. This one. This one and Judaism. Satan knows the truth. Satan knows very well. He, he knows this better than any one of us. He's delusional that he thinks he can still overcome it, but he knows it. He knows it's the truth, and he knows that every time somebody comes to Christ, that's a battle that he's lost. His goal is to keep everybody out of this building. His goal is to keep everybody away from Christ. He doesn't want anybody to know the truth. So is Satan above uh, or, or beyond doing something good to keep people out of church or to keep people from Christ? Absolutely not. That's where the cults come from. It's the skin of the truth stuffed with a lie. And he has no problem with people doing wonderful things and you know, doing great things for society and all that. That's great as long as they don't come to Christ. That's the goal. And so we're in a, a society today where the political system is openly hostile towards Christianity. And if we as Christians just sit there and say, oh, well, you know, I can't mix politics and religion. I can't talk about it. Guess what? We're going we're, we're gonna to ride slowly off into the sunset, and that'll be the end of our country, uh, the end of society, really because we're the only thing that holds society together right now. So I will mix my politics and religion, and no, I won't shut up. So that's my, uh, that's my take on that. Now, do you want to be the leader that God designed you to be? 
I think we as men, we all want to be leaders. And God designed each one of us specifically to be a leader. Uh, and the way that you do that is to feed your subconscious mind. Your, your brain's like a factory. Uh, if you put good materials in, good products come out. If you put this in, good stuff comes out. Uh, there's a lot of good uh, Christian authors, good books uh, on leadership and on Christianity that are, that are very good that will help you to understand more. I highly recommend that. Uh, if you want to be a good leader, I recommend you read minimally 15 minutes a day. 15 minutes, that's all. Just 15 minutes, preferably right before you go to bed. Your subconscious mind is working 24 hours a day. It never stops, doesn't sleep. And it works on what goes in through here and what goes in through here. So if you take this and you put it in right before you go to bed, what's your brain gonna be working on for the rest of the night? It's gonna be working on this. When you wake up in the morning, put a little bit of this in to start your day. Okay, uh, I can recommend some very good authors if you want to see me afterwards for books that, that s focus specifically on leadership. But I think the problem we have in our country is a lack of leaders. We have a lack of, of men who are leaders that are godly men. Um, I would recommend Proverbs every day. You know, read, read some scripture before you go to sleep at night, but when you wake up in the morning, there's 31 Proverbs for a reason. One for every day. So read a proverb every day. Do that for three months, and I will guarantee you, just, just test me on this, okay? Read Proverbs one a day for three months, and you will think differently than you do now. I can promise you. It's guaranteed that it, it, you know, test me, try it, prove me wrong, okay? Good stuff is in here. Uh, let's see. Now some things that we need to, to put off and put on, uh, you know, as a church. Things that should never, uh, never be present here. And, but it's human nature. We all succumb to it. But things that we need to work on. Uh, and again, I'm not saying anything specific to us. Uh, most of these I don't really think we have a problem with. But things that we need to be on guard against. One of them is murmuring. Uh, I think it's Philippians 2.14. Uh, Do all things without murmurings and disputings. That's what we have to put off. What we put on is Hebrews 13, 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So we want good stuff coming out of here, not negative. The problem with negative coming out of here is it goes right in here. So if you speak negative, it's not just the other person that you're impacting, it's yourself. Okay, very, very important to understand that. Complaining. Uh, Hebrews 13, five, let your conversation be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Uh, and, and to put on 1 Timothy 6.8, it says, and having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Complaining. Again, it all comes down to belief and unbelief. Do we believe God's word? When, when God says that all things work together for good, for us, we're the called, right? We're the called. We, we're those who are chosen by him. If we believe that all things work together for our good, what do we have to complain about? If I get in a, go out here and get in a car wreck today, if I believe that God says, and, and I believe it, that that's for my good because he allowed it to happen, do I have a reason to complain? 
I don't think so. All things work together for our good. So if we feel like somebody else has more stuff than we do, or we feel like we've been slighted, or you know, we feel like somebody said something we didn't like, and I, let me, let me assure you, okay, Philippians 3.12, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. And I have to apologize because there's a lot of times that I complain, you know, especially when it comes to talking about social issues and all the things that are happening around us. Uh, and I have to, this is, this is for me, you know, when, when, when I keep hearing all these things and, and God told me I needed to put it together to, to, to speak about it, it's for me. <laughs> That's why he gave it to me, because I'm the one that needs to learn all this, okay? Uh, and hopefully you guys will get some of the uh, overflow from that. But uh, complaining, complaining is, it, it, it's, uh, how do I put it? it it's like a, a rottenness in the bones. It just makes you feel horrible. Uh, to have complaining. Same thing with gossip. Uh, 1 Timothy 5.13 and uh, talking about gossip. And with all they learned to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle but tattlers and also busybodies, speaking things which they ought not to speak. And what are we to put on? Ephesians 4.29 let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. You know, again, this is for me. When we speak to one another, are we lifting one another up? Are we saying things that are edifying? Are we speaking godly wisdom? Are we speaking positive? Watch what comes out of here. It's powerful. We, you know, <laughs> lots and lots and lots of verses talk about the tongue because the tongue has a lot more power than people sometimes think it has. Very powerful what comes out. You have to be very careful uh, with what comes out of your mouth. So how can we have, uh, how can we obtain a good testimony? Um, the impact and influence that we have on the people around us is directly determined by our intimacy with God. If you have an intimate relationship with God, you are going to have impact on the lives of others. If you just have a superficial relationship with God, you're not gonna have impact with others. And that includes people that we meet, people we know at church, people in our family. Uh, it's everybody that we deal with. We can't expect a human relationship to satisfy our need for an intimate relationship with God. So there's, there's four types of relationships with God. One is direct. Everybody has that. God created us. So, so that, whether we're aware of it or not, we have that direct relationship as his creation. Now, the second kind is a distinct relationship. In other words, we've recognized who God is, and we've accepted him. So now we have a distinct relationship with him. Uh, but many times we have the third type of relationship with, which is distant. In other words, there's no effort involved. We know God's there, we know he created us. We, you know, maybe we even made a profession of faith, but we don't really do anything with it. You know, we're, we're just, uh, you know, uh, a lot of folks that they'll go on Christmas and Easter out of duty. You know, that type of thing. That would be the distant relationship. But the fourth type is the one that we want, and that's the developing relationship. That's the one that's seeking to know him more. That's where we develop spiritual intimacy with God. And, and what is spiritual intimacy? It, it, it certainly goes much deeper than physical intimacy. We, we tend to think of intimacy as, as a physical thing with a spouse, but intimacy just means that closeness. Uh, it's open and it's honest, it's trusting. 
in other words, we don't just pray, okay, Lord, um, um, you know, I know I'm a sinner. Thank you for forgiving me. Uh, and then we run out the door to work. Intimacy means we spend time and we talk to God and we say, oh, Lord, you know, I know I blew it. I had this thought in my head and I shouldn't have. And, and you know, I, I got upset with the guy who cut me off on the street the other day. And we go into detail with them. We spend time with them. But it's two-way communications. It's not just us giving our laundry list.